cool. So, what the hell does this title even mean, right? Storage is stateful. What is a stateless storage? So, hopefully, by the time I'm done, I would have successfully defended this title. That's my goal. So, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm Sugu. I am the co-creator of Vitesse. Uh, show of hands, how many of you have heard of Vitesse? Okay, things are getting better. Uh, how many of you, uh, so I guess the other, uh, how many of you don't know anything about Vitesse? Okay, you're all honest because A plus B equal to approximately the total number of people in the room. <laughs> okay, so that means that I will spend slightly more time covering uh, what Vitesse does and uh, then, um, so that I actually had, have a lot of content, I can go for like about five hours, but I was told that I have only 40 minutes. So, what I'll do is I'll try to rush and at the end if we have time, I'll do a full detailed demo. If we are out of time, I'll like crunch it up and show it in small format. So, what is Vitesse? Uh, there is some history behind Vitesse which I will cover, but uh, if you today if you want to know quickly like what can I do with Vitesse, the first thing you can do is Vitesse as far as I know is the only cloud native database in the world. Uh, it's the only system that can confidently say that you can run on Kubernetes without losing data. So, that is what Vitesse is and I'll talk about why that is the case and also why uh, there are not other storage systems that have started making this claim. Uh, there are storage systems that are kind of beginning to defend, but no one can come out and boldly say, we are a cloud native database, no? only Vitesse is able to say that. And uh, the other property of Vitesse is that it is massively scalable. Massively means really, really massive. We'll cover some of that. Highly available. Highly available uh, in Vitesse land means about five nines of availability. Should be comfortable. Five nines is the golden, stand, uh, golden standard. The reason is because six nines of availability is uh, theoretically goes into your response latency, which doesn't make sense. So, if you took like five milliseconds to respond, if you add all that up, it is impossible to get six nines of availability. And uh, it is based on MySQL. What that means is that it can uh, use, it uses MySQL underneath. It also speaks the MySQL protocol. So, as far as the application is concerned, it thinks that it's talking to MySQL. So, how does it do that? It's basically through sharding. So, what it does is under the covers, it can take your single MySQL instance and then break it up into really, really, really small parts and then scale indefinitely and massively. So, how it does that? We'll try to cover some of that. Uh, Vitesse is a CNCF project. How many of you know about CNCF? Okay, cool. CNCF is actually a new foundation called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, it was actually, it's essentially a foundation that was started to support Kubernetes. How many of you know Kubernetes? Okay, all of you know Kubernetes. So, we don't know if Kubernetes founded CNCF or CNCF founded Kubernetes, but they were kind of, they are kind of synonym, uh, but uh, after that foundation started taking off, CNCF started taking on other projects that are cloud native and Vitesse was actually the first storage project to be uh, accepted in the CNCF. As a matter of fact, it was a big controversy because they were like, oh, databases are not cloud native, why would we take a storage system like Vitesse into cloud native? Then they went into an argument about what cloud native means and all that. So, uh, short story long, uh, Vitesse is now, not only a cloud native project, they have uh, tiers of uh, or levels of um, project success. A graduated project in CNCF means that it has reached the highest level. It means that it is on par. There are uh, CNCF has, uh, I don't know how many projects, but uh, Vitesse was the eighth project to reach graduation um, in cloud native. Like for example, CNCF holds conferences all over the world. Um, and the conference has been growing. The last one they had uh, was in San Diego uh, and they had 12,000 people attend it. So, that's uh, how big um, CNCF is, how big Kubernetes is. Uh, so, it's all pretty exciting for, for all of us. Okay, these are some of the stats. Uh, the, the, best, the most exciting part of the stats are who uses Vitesse. Uh, at the end of the day, that's actually a testimony to the success of a project. So, actually somebody came and told me, uh, 
like all these other storage systems have this comparison charts. You know, like I can do acid, I can do this, I can do durability across data centers, etc., etc. Why is with us not have those charts? You know, uh, I don't know. I, I guess I don't need charts because people are using it. <laughs> people are not using it. Maybe I want to show charts. You know. But then I thought about it. I and then I said, you know what? We should go ask these people, the adopters. Um, why they are using Vitesse, in spite of the fact that we don't have a comparison chart. Yeah. So if you look at the adopters, it's a pretty impressive list. The, what I would say is that these companies are kind of the technology leaders. They are, they kind of dictate what is going to happen in the future. They are, they, um, if they do something some way, then everybody goes and listens to what they have to, how they are doing it and they want to repeat it. So that's the exciting part about Vitesse is that it has basically uh, pretty impressive. I mean, look at uh, Slack, GitHub, uh, JD. Uh, so I'll talk about some of these companies, but we have a pretty impressive list of uh, adopters. So here's the first one. Oops, I chopped one slide. Yes. So Slack, right? Slack is. Uh, any of you know about Slack? Yeah. Heard about Slack? Yes. <laughs> uh, Slack is basically a company that's experiencing hyper growth, and uh, they uh, found out with us about three years ago and started studying it and um, uh, they were actually at a crossroads where they had sharded their application and uh, they were not happy with it for a couple of reasons. One is uh, it was really, really hard to manage the shards and the other one was their business needs are changing and then they said like this sharding scheme is not going to work for us anymore. So that's when they studied with us and they were studying with trying to figure out should we build something ourselves or should we buy? And then somebody inside Slack said, oh, have you heard of Vitesse? You, know, you should go talk to them. So they talked to us. Then when I went and presented to them, I told them, you know what? Why not both? You should build and buy. So, and that's what you get to use Vitesse because you buy into Vitesse for free. I mean, you're not paying any money because it's an open source software. But then if there's something missing in Vitesse, you can build it because it's an open source project. So they liked that story. So they started uh, uh, learning with us, and they are now one of the main contributors uh, to uh, to this project. And um, and this is a quote from uh, their principal engineer. And essentially, this is um, a testimony to how much Vita, how passionate people are about with us, how much they love it, and uh, how much they trust it. Actually, uh, there's another quote from Demer saying that we don't plan to change this ever in the future kind of quote. No? We don't have any other short term plans of changing because with us, we believe that with us is going to uh, meet all our needs, which is pretty exciting. Um, and uh, how many of you have heard of JD.com? Yes, the Paytm person has heard of JD.com. <laughs> uh, there's a few others. So JD.com is kind of the uh, Amazon of China. They are, uh, they have $67 billion in revenue and uh, they use uh, with us. How they came about is kind of funny, but since I'm short of time, maybe I'll tell you the story in the hallway. But they are what I would call massive scale. Um, they use, uh, so $67 billion in revenue. They are the largest, one of the largest uh, retail uh, portals in China. So I don't know how many of you have seen storage QPS. Try to imagine what would be a really, really high QPS. Try to make a guess. And I will tell you how much they are doing. And then we'll see later if your guess matched. Try to guess how much JD.com uh, uh, did as QPS. So they have about 4,000 key spaces, which is essentially a, a logical database, but it could be sharded. When it's sharded into 1632, it's still one key space. They have about 4,000 key spaces. They are, oh, the number came out. <laughs> 35 million QPS. So that is what they did on their, uh, their Diwali. You know? It's called the Singles Day, which is. Uh, um, on the 11th of November. Uh, and they are all on Kubernetes, so which is the exciting part. How many of you have heard of Nozzle? None. Because it's actually a tiny startup. So you can understand somebody like JD using Vitess, but why would a tiny startup use Vitess? So their story is they are, a, they are a startup, but what they wanted was they wanted the benefit of Kubernetes. Why did they want Kubernetes? Is because um, uh, they wanted flexibility. So their story is they um, they were shopping for a place to run their software, 
they went, uh, they talked to Azure and Azure gave them a really awesome deal, like huge amount of credits. Azure does that for you, if you know how to negotiate, they give you huge credits. So they went to Azure and they were running it, but guess what happens? Uh, GKE finds out, GC, GCP finds out, hey, we can give you a better deal. So they said, oh, okay. So because they were in Kubernetes, in one hour, they just pack their bags and move to GKE. So that's what you can do if you're all in Kubernetes. No lock-in, uh, no vendor lock-in and complete portability. So, and that is um, the reason why you should run your software fully cloud native, native including storage. So right now, um, there are not many storage systems, but there is huge benefits in moving to it and uh, Vitesse is leading the wave and uh, let's hope it remains that way. No? So I have now used the cloud native a few times. Um, what is cloud native? There is a lot of people who claim uh, to be cloud native, but uh, there is actually a clear um, definition of what cloud native is and how does that apply to storage is what I am going to cover now. Um, so for that, um, we have to go back in history into uh, early YouTube days. Um, because there are two reasons why Vitesse is cloud native. One, there is a historical reason and then there is a technical reason. So the historical reason is, it goes into YouTube history when uh, after uh, Google bought us, uh, we were still on bare metal. Uh, and uh, we built actually with Tess on bare metal and uh, there was no cloud. This was, we are talking 2010, the cloud did not exist then. And um, uh, everything was fine. I mean, our own data centers, we had our uh, fate was in our hands. Everything was completely fine, you know, perfect. Not really. <laughs> uh, things were on fire. Uh, outages every other day and uh, almost every time it was always the database you know, uh, because that is what somehow causes outages in uh, systems. So uh, my co-creator uh, co Mike and I said, hey, we need to do something about this. Let's take ourselves out of this rotation and figure out how to leap ahead of all these uh, storage problems that we are having. And that is essentially how uh, Vitesse was born. Uh, but then we deployed it, launched it and actually it kind of got slightly happy. But in 2013, uh, Snowden happened. How many of you remember the Snowden story? Yeah, Snowden happened and all US companies got spooked and they said, and Google said, hey, you can't have your uh, data outside Google anymore, you need to move it inside Google. So we had a very aggressive project to migrate everything into Google very, very quickly. And uh, until then, we were quite happy. We didn't know what cloud was. We didn't know what this Borg thing was. Google has this thing called Borg, which is their internal cloud. And uh, when we went and looked at their APIs and stuff, that what you needed to do to run entire inside uh, Google, uh, you essentially had to build a system for that platform because Google is an ecosystem. They have load balances. They have they have APIs, custom APIs for everything. And how do you move something like Vitesse into Google? That is one part of the story. The other part of the story is, uh, if you are writing software inside Google, you are only supposed to write the stateless part of your application. If you want to store your uh, data somewhere, Google gave you APIs. You just call those APIs and it will store them. And they were very fixed APIs. You are not allowed to store anything in a file. So Google doesn't allow that. You, there is something called Colossus, which is actually, um, a uh, uh, blob storage, you can put your uh, software there. There's Bigtable, all of you have heard of Bigtable and there were a couple of other systems but there was no relational database that you could store your data on. And Google says you need to move all your data there, figure out a way to do it. You know? So that's when we, uh, we made two difficult calls. One is to keep Vitesse open source in spite of making it work inside Google. So we built layers and layers of abstraction and did that. The second thing which we did is what made uh, Vitesse cloud native is because you have these APIs. Uh, so the, so um, Google says, so we decided to run Vitesse as if it was a stateless application. What does it mean is that the, the way uh, you write stateless application is when you launch your application in Google, it will run you 
you have a file system, you can write to it. But as soon as Google reschedules your uh, pod, uh, all your data is lost. It will wipe your data and restart your process somewhere else. So we figured out a way to make Vitesse run in that environment using ephemeral local storage. So how did we do that is just having a master, have a large number of replicas, and I don't know how many of you have heard of semi-sync replication in MySQL, we use that, which means that if you commit data, it is guaranteed that at least one other replica has it. And uh, using that, we managed to port the entire YouTube traffic into Borg. Uh, uh, probably a few million QPS, huge amount of writes, and we never lost data. So, um, we were kind of, I think, the first storage engine that ran as a stateless application in Borg. So, I call this stateless storage. And uh, that is my defense. I mean, it's better than serverless. <laughs> what is serverless? But at least stateless storage now makes sense. You are a stateless application, but we still store your data for you. And uh, in 2015, Google announces Kubernetes and we look at the features, says, hey, we can run in this system because we run on Borg, Kubernetes has the same features, we know how to run on Kubernetes. So we announced before Kubernetes 1.0 came out saying that Vitas is ready for Kubernetes. And uh, guess what, people actually believed us. They said, oh, you think you can run in Kubernetes, can we? Say, yeah, yeah, sure, start running it because in reality, we were running YouTube like that. So we had the confidence. So the first adopter was a company called Stitch Labs. And uh, uh, they went into production in 2016. And by now, uh, that's by far the longest running Vitesse workload on Kubernetes. Uh, so it's been running there. Then came a few more companies. HubSpot came and um, uh, they went on Kubernetes. JD came and they showed that not only can you run on Kubernetes, you can run on massive scale, as you saw the QPS, some of the stuff that they have done. And finally, Nozzle came and showed that uh, the advantage of running in Kubernetes is the portability. So we have a nice and beautiful story for uh, Vitesse. So all that happens, um, there's this person called Kelsey Hightower. He is actually uh, somewhat of a celebrity in the Kubernetes CNCF world. Uh, he is the oracle of Kubernetes, so he predicts things is the evangelist for Kubernetes. So we've been running this, and then Kelsey, look at the date here. The date here is 2019. So last year, he says, do not run databases on Kubernetes. You will regret it. And I'm like, Kelsey, we, we know how to run. But then, he's, then he has a point. He says, if you take just MySQL or Postgres and run it in Kubernetes, you will regret it. You will lose data, or you will lose uptime because uh, those softwares are not cloud native. And if you try to run them in Kubernetes, you are going to have trouble. The reason comes goes back to the Borg days where Google um, doesn't respect the data written locally by the application. Basically, it says, the data your application writes, I consider it ephemeral. If I reschedule you, I will wipe your data. That same rule exists in Kubernetes. So if you took MySQL and ran uh, ran that in a system like Borg or Kubernetes, uh, you will have a lot of trouble. So I'm going to quickly go through a few scenarios. Uh, I'll, I, I usually spend more time on this, but I want to uh, jump ahead and see if I can cover the demo. Uh, so obviously, if you took MySQL and ran it on local storage, that's, I just said it's not recommended because if you reschedule, you lost your data. So this is not a viable uh, uh, configuration. But this is viable configuration if you are doing testing. If you are running tests, your pod is short lived, bring it up all in one, run it, finish your test and throw it away. It's really nice for that. The other uh, approach is to use a mounted volume. Uh, if you use a mounted volume, your uh, pod gets rescheduled, the new instance comes up and reconnect to that mounted volume. But there are some problems. One problem is MySQL if it crashes and you uh, reschedule it somewhere else, it needs to do crash recovery. Who knows how long that's going to take, right? There are sometimes crash recoveries that take an hour. So that's one problem. 
The other problem is these databases are tuned for local disk. And if you suddenly put a mounted volume there, the latency is different, the performance characteristics are different. So your application may not, may not perform the same way. So those are the two problems with this approach. The third problem is the more common uh, way by which people run uh, MySQL is I uh, have a master and have a bunch of replicas. If a master goes down, you fail over. But if you, uh, the problem with uh, failover in Kubernetes is a pod is not a first class citizen uh, in Kubernetes. There is something called the stateful set and there is nothing stateful about the stateful set. The stateful set is a stateless way of running pods. Uh, they initially called it um, uh, cattle and uh, I don't know if you've heard that uh, argument. They didn't like the pets versus cattle argument because somebody started arguing cattle is also a pet, you know. So they went with uh, stateful set. You know? And so uh, stateful set, it basically allows you to address each, each pod by its name. That, that's what it's stateful means. So you can run in stateful set, but you cannot, uh, Kubernetes won't uh, distinguish a master from a replica. As far as Kubernetes is concerned, they're all the same. You could say, okay, I will always run pod zero as my master. But the problem there is if pod zero goes down, you reparent to a replica, you have to go tell the uh, application, oh, it's not pod zero anymore, it's pod one. So what that means is that you cannot run this without an orchestration layer that actually um, watches these changes. If there's a reparent, it has to go inform the application. So um, the short story long is if you run MySQL in Kubernetes, you need to build these uh, uh, these layers without which you cannot run uh, in Kubernetes. Essentially, that's what Vitesse did. Vitesse built these uh, uh, impedance mismatch thing, you know. So built these layers in the middle that made sure that if you run MySQL within Kubernetes, it will perform all this orchestration needed uh, for that. So, and then um, there are other problems with the cloud which are not really uh, uh, good for people migrating from on-prem solutions. Uh, the life cycle, for example, I mean, when we are in YouTube, our master uptime used to be like six months. It's not unheard of to have a master that is up for six months. But in the, in, uh, the cloud world, you'll be lucky if your master is up for a week. Uh, sometimes master goes on multiple times a day. Um, the data size, you're used to seeing like 10 terabytes, 15 terabytes of data. Kubernetes doesn't like that because if it reschedules a pod, you can't just like take 10 terabytes and move it around. So it likes you to run smaller instance sizes. Uh, IPs get reused. These are not things that a um, on-prem solution likes. Uh, and then there are other uh, things about uh, if there's a topology server, you have to make sure you don't overload it because those are not really high QPS systems. So all these issues we had to resolve when we moved Vitesse to Borg. And the same issues exist in Kubernetes. So when we moved to Kubernetes, these things were automatically taken care of. So just being able to say I'm functionally can run in Kubernetes is not insufficient. You have to have uh, sensitivities to these issues and make sure that you can handle these types of uh, environment changes. All right. And then finally, uh, uh, after arguing with Kelsey, he has now changed his standpoint. Now he says that don't run your MySQL directly on Kubernetes or Postgres on Kubernetes, but you can use orchestration systems. And if you use them, it is safe to run them. So this is uh, the Vitas architecture. And uh, uh, there are three principles that we used in this architecture. One is simplicity, which means that every component that is there is necessary and must be there and no more than that. The other one is loose coupling, uh, which means that no single component is directly dependent on another component, which means that in this system, things can go down and come up independent of each other, and the system will tie itself back together as you bring them back up. And the third one is survivability, which means that there is no single component in this system that uh, is... Uh, that we cannot afford to lose. We can afford to lose any, sing, any component and the system will know what to do about it and can wait until that component is resurrected, it will continue to work. So based on these principles, uh, we built with TAS. 
in reality we did not have this principle. We figured out that eventually when we got it working, these are the three principles that we ended up with. Now, I am speaking as if like we designed it from the ground up to be that way. <laughs> um, but that, uh, so essentially when uh, the app servers connect uh, to these VT gates, these VT gates are all stateless which means that they can come up and go down as needed. You can add more as needed uh, or shrink them back. Uh, so, when an app server connects to a VT gate, it thinks that it is connected to a humongous database. Uh, but in reality, it is actually a cluster of multiple databases in the back end. And these VT tablets, there is one VT tablet for MySQL. Uh, it is essentially a minder of MySQL. It proxies queries, make sure it has connection pools proxies queries into VT tablet uh, and does housekeeping work like uh, taking backup, restores and everything. And uh, uh, when a VT tablet comes up, it goes tells the topology I exist and then the topology says ok, noted. The VT gates watch the topology as soon as they discover a new VT tablet, they connect to the VT tablet and say ok, start serving queries. There is a lot more to it than just this. Uh, but this is essentially the principle based on which with us was built. And now there is demo. I am actually thinking I should not uh, do a live, I think it's live demo or screenshots? Live demo, okay. Let us see if it works. <laughs> okay, okay. Actually, there is a couple of more slides I should cover here. If it comes up, okay. So, uh, here is a simple schema. Uh, uh, all of you familiar with databases? Yeah, this is a very simple application. It is a marketplace. Uh, there are customers coming and buying products from a merchant. Uh, that is uh, as, and so which there is a customer, there is a customer table, there is a product table, and there is a merchant table. And when a customer places an order, uh, the order table has foreign keys, one back to customer, the person the, what they uh, who ordered, the product what they ordered and the merchant who they ordered it from, simple right. You would think that this schema is easy to scale, it is not. The reason is because if this goes into billions of customers, uh, how do you shard this system? Right? You can say customer shard the customer. Uh, obviously. Products, not many products. Right? So, product can be unsharded in a separate database. Merchant may or may not be sharded, but in something like where a really, really huge marketplace, you may need to shard the merchant also. But where do you put orders? You put them with customer or you put them with the merchant? So, so far we have always said you can, you have to make a choice. In a sharded system, this you do not have a choice. You have to choose which relationship is stronger. And in this case, I am implying that orders is uh, strongest associated with customer. So, we are going to say, we are going to put, an, uh, put the order with customer. So, I am going to show you a system that is sharded this way and we are going to talk about uh, what challenges. So, this is essentially what the, so there is a product which is unsharded database, customer is sharded and the merchant is sharded on their own shard. And obviously, this yellow line is going to be a problem. This purple line is also going to be a problem. So, we will talk about all those problems. So, here is my e-commerce application, it is very sophisticated. If it comes up. If it does not come up, we go to slides. I am connected to the internet, yes. Yes, it came up. Let me make it make the font bigger. Is this readable? Maybe no, this is too too big. Okay, this is readable. Okay, so here's my e-commerce application. This is basically a pretend e-commerce application. You have to pretend that you are a customer, and then you have to execute the SQL statement to create yourself. If you you have to, you have to pretend that you are pl placing an order, so you go and say insert into order. No, that's that like. It is uh, it's cool because you actually see what we test us under the covers, but it is not cool for a real user. <laughs> say, I want to place an order, please send me your select statement. <laughs> so, uh, I am going to uh, make this font bigger. 
uh, let's see, I have a readme here. Okay, so I am going to first load data into this thing. So, let us look at what is in data. So, this is a bunch of insert statements, you know, there is insert into customer, insert into merchant, product. So, basically prime, prime the database. These are, these are statements that do not talk about any sharding or anything, they are just talking as if it is a single database. So, I am going to run this directly against uh, uh, MySQL. Let me, uh, okay. I am going to say run this, uh, oops, uh, I have some auto completion problem. Okay. So, I am going to say MySQL please execute this statement uh, against the uh, cluster that I just created. And uh, if you look at this cluster, there is a product which is unsharded. Customer is a sharded uh, cluster, there are two shards and merchant has two shards. So, that is the setup here. So, run this it says data is loaded and I refresh and voila. So, data is loaded. So, what this application does is it actually snapshots the database before every operation and then shows you what has changed. So, anything that is highlighted reddish is new is what it has discovered as new. So, yeah. So, basically it is loaded as you can see some rows went on the left side, left side of customer, some rows went on the right side of customer. So, this is something that Vitess can figure out for you. You just send your inserts, send your selects and Vitess will know uh, where to route that query. So, that is the first proper superpower of Vitess. If I say select star from product, uh, it says, oh, I know where product is. Product is in the product database. So, I am going to send it to. So, this uh, right hand side green window shows uh, what Vitess did with your query. So, it says I sent your query to the product database because I know that product is in the product database and on the left side is the result. If I say select star from customer, it says, ah, customer is a sharded database. If you said select star from customer, then I have to collect all rows from all shards. So, I am going to send this select star from customer, scatter it to all shards, gather the results and send it uh, together. If I said where uh, CID equal to 1, it will do something else. It says, oh, I know that customer ID 1 is in uh, the left shard, so I will just send it there to so dash 80. 8 is because uh, hexadecimal, so 8 is in the middle. Yeah. All right. Now, let us make it do something cooler. So, this is a join. This says, get me all the customers and their orders. So, do a join of customer with order and give me a joint uh, thing. So, from customer is one and join with orders, right? What should happen in this case? It should all be scattered. The reason is because the way the system is sharded, orders live with their customers. So, if you can see that the customer ID 1, all their orders are with uh, uh, in that shard itself. So, if you give this query to Vitess, it says, yeah, I know. I know that the orders are living together with their customer, so I will just do a simple scatter. But if you did something crazy where you order like if you, uh, if you did something that is relationally meaningless, but like for example, did this join, right? Instead of CID did OID, it will do something else. Oh, it did not like it. Oh, o OID does not exist. Anyway, never mind. So, it will do a scatter query and do a nested loop join, do all that stuff. but will give you a relationally accurate answer that has no, no practical uh, meaning. We can try this query again, but I want to get to the end, the more exciting part. Uh, so, we will come back to that, we have time. Now, I am going to do an even more complicated query. So, this query says, I want to know the product names that were ordered by the customer. So, what you are doing is joining customer with the order, finding the product ID of the order and then go to the product table, fetch the product name. So, let us see what we test us with this. It says, oh, I know that customer and order are local to each other. So, I am going to break this query up into two parts. One is the part that, join, that joins, oh, I have five minutes left. So, I am going, going to go really, really fast. Um, and then, for each of those rows that come, I need to go look up the order. So, I will do nested loop joins against 
the product. So, in this scenario, but this is painful right, what if you have a million customers for each row that you got you have to do round trips against uh, against the order. So, what Vitesse allows you to do is to say hey I know product is a small table, what if we materialize that in every shard of customer, then it will work fine. So, I am going to accelerate that command, let us see, I have it here, run it, refresh, it is materialized. So, now, now if I run, but then it is the name of the table is different because it is a order that is in uh, the customer. So, this is the query and you can see now it, it is doing a simple scatter. And if you go and the more important thing is if you go and like added a product right. So, I am going to insert into product. As soon as you insert into product, that thing is immediately replicated into the target. So, this is actually a true materialized view which means that you make something change the source table, the targets table are kept up to date which means that your queries will continue to work with the local join efficiently. And the same thing can be done where if a merchant wants to join with order right. So, that is also a problem. So, I will keep a skip ahead of the steps that do not work and show you what works. Uh, let us see. So, I am now going to materialize the order table into the merchant's database, but the difference is that merchant is also sharded, source is sharded, target is sharded, not only that the target is sharded by a different key. In the in the source, source is sharded by customer ID, the target target is sharded by merchant name. So, now let me refresh and there you go, it is materialized and then even if you um, even if you uh, like like now let us say here is a query where it changes the merchant name of the source. So, I am going to change uh, order ID 1 which is this one is monoprice, I am going to change it to um, new egg. Now, let us see what happens if we do that, boom. So, here the row changed, but in the target the row moved. So, it is actually a relationally consistent view of the source, which means that you can rely on the accuracy of the uh, target data. There is one more example which I do not have time to go into, which is actually the way these materializations happen is by actually saying that materialize this table and uh, the materialization is expressed as a select statement. I want this table to be materialized as a select statement, select a comma b comma c a c and put it in the other table. But the obvious question is 2 minutes and I am almost done, what can you do aggregations? Can I say, can I do a materialization using a count star? No? Can you do a sum? The answer is yes. Uh, this works for uh, those expressions also. If I had time, I would show you that. But uh, there are other demos where I have shown where I have see, I have shown this to work. So I'm out of time. It was great talking to you. If you have any questions, I have 30 seconds to answer them. <laughs> yes. OLTP transactions could be pretty expensive depending upon their on various machines and everything. Right. So, uh, like which sort of data traffic is more preferable? Is it OLTP? Do you like which is does which is support OLTP transactions also? Or is it is built for OLTP mainly OLTP people that come for OLAP we tell them go elsewhere. Oh, so so then it's how will you handle those joins and everything? If suppose merchant's table was that large that you cannot materialize in a yeah, there are some OLAP transactions that Vitesse can do. Okay. And uh, uh, not all joins are OLAP. There are joins that you have to do for OLTP systems. Yeah. So those are still needed. Uh, so that is that is still uh, required. But then the the read time would increase in the sense that you will have to take your query to different different shards and different different. Correct. Yeah. So that so that problem is solved by materialization. So because yeah. OLTP transactions also need these joins. Like if you have to do it with a merchant you still have to do multiple round trips that you still avoid. So, okay. there is a big gap between OLTP and OLAP, uh, there is I don't know I don't, you can call it OLTAP or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Vitesse takes you pretty close uh, in that area and only the last part where which are pure OLAP queries that you can export and 
uh, into a columnar so. store. Actually, a yeah. row-based store yeah. is not recommended for OLAP, yeah. for, at least for that type of query. Makes sense. Yeah.